Can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. I like to be heard. I think we all like to be heard. Well, welcome. Welcome to uh, Green Mountain College and uh, welcome to our opening presentation for Green Mountain College's uh, Sustainable Food System Research Symposium. Uh, we're very pleased to have Dr. Phil Howard here with us this evening uh, to help us launch uh, this uh, wonderful symposium on the occasion of our MSFS residency. So MSFS, Masters of Sustainable Food Systems, we're very proud of the work that you all do in your communities. And for those of you who don't know, this is um, the nation's first online uh, master's program in sustainable food systems. Um, I wasn't here when the program was designed, although our founder is here, uh, Philip Ackerman Leist. Uh, but I'll tell you, since I've become the director um, and become engaged in the program, I've come to realize that college towns have lots of agents of change, but our rural communities and our hometowns don't have enough of them. And so uh, I'm so honored to be a part of this program where we get to help you and empower you to bring about changes in your food systems. Unfortunately, too often this means helping to rebuild sustainable and just food systems in your communities. Uh, but we're so proud to have the opportunity to work with you on that journey. It brings meaning and purpose to our engagement with you in our courses. And it's so nice to see all of you uh, once per year to get together to talk about all of the amazing things that you're doing in your communities. Um, so when you're trying to bring about change, it helps to know what it is you're trying to change. And that's where we're so happy to have Dr. Phil Howard here with us tonight to help us understand, is food diversity an illusion? So how can we change if we don't know what it is we're trying to change? Uh, Dr. Phil Howard it has a book coming out in a couple weeks. We're very excited about that. Many of you know it's required reading, his previous publications in our uh, food systems program. The title of his new book is Concentration in Power in the Food System, Who Controls What We Eat? Um, I had the privilege of being able to look at that book, and it's great. I think you'll be really excited. Count on it being required reading moving forward in our program. Dr. Phil Howard is a member of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. He's the current president of Agriculture, Food, and Human Values Society. And he comes to us from the University, or excuse me, Michigan State University. You can tell, sorry, I went to University of Michigan. It just comes out automatically. <laughs> I have to discipline myself, sorry. So Michigan State University. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Dr. Phil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Robin. It's, it's great to be here. And I just want to mention, uh, this is my website. A lot of the slides that I'm going to show are available on my website if you want to look at them later in more detail. And I'll also have this up at the end. So you may have heard the figure that the average supermarket contains about 40,000 unique items. And that number tends to get higher every year. But like a lot of statistics, this can be misleading. For example, if you go to a typical supermarket like Shaw's down the street and you go all the way to the back to the refrigerator case where they have the margarine, you'll probably found, find about a dozen different brands, including all nine of these. But what's much harder to see, unless you pick up the packages and look very closely for a small symbol, is that all nine of those are owned by just two companies, Unilever headquartered in France and ConAgra of the United States. And then if you go to back to the front of the store in the produce section, you might find a lot of different options for bagged salads, leafy greens, bagged spinach. You might find, say, these five different brands. But what's absolutely impossible to see is that all five of these may have come from the same processing plant in California. 
And then if you go all over the store, you'll find a number of different products ranging from beverages, infant formula, cereals, snacks. Uh, if you look very closely at the ingredient list, you'll realize that they all contain the same primary ingredient. You can guess what it is, right? Corn. Other than water, the primary ingredient is corn. And then if you go all over the store again, you'll find thousands of products that contain cow's milk. But what you can't see is that more than 93% of that milk comes from just one breed of cow, even though there are more than 1,000 breeds of cattle worldwide. So to answer this question very quickly, is food diversity an illusion? Well, no and yes. I mean, we do have a huge, maybe even overwhelming number of choices when it comes to brands, varieties, and even tastes. But in these four areas, ownership, production, ingredients, and breeds and seeds, uh, the, the diversity is a lot less than it appears. And I've looked at a lot of different foods and beverages over the years. Everyone I've looked at, the dominant trend is away from diversity and towards uniformity. Uh, and why is this a problem? Well, I've listed some of the potential problems down below, which might include uh, supporting values we don't agree with, potential health impacts, even threatening the future of the food supplies. So the news isn't all bad. I mean, it's pretty bad, but uh, there are some counter trends. There are some tiny counter trends that are trying to move away from uniformity and towards diversity. And we have to keep in mind that they're very small, uh, but they're also providing some alternatives that we can support. So this is what I'm gonna talk about, and I'm gonna spend the most time on ownership uh, because that's what I've really focused on for the last 15 or so years, and then I'm gonna talk about those other three areas. So ownership uh, is becoming more uniform, which results in fewer and fewer people making decisions about the food we eat. So here are a few examples. I wanna start with organic food. Uh, people are really fascinated by this because organic food has its origins as an alternative to the conventional food system. But in terms of ownership, it's becoming more and more like the conventional food system. So I'm gonna play an animation here. This is the first frame, which starts in 1995. Back at that time, all those green dots you see were independent organic food brands, mostly processed foods. Those larger yellow circles, those are multinational food processors, and you don't see any yet, but what you, what you will see are some uh, medium blue circles. Those are investment firms or venture capitalists. So this animation goes all the way to 2007. A couple years after it starts, the National Organic Standards, uh, in the first draft was released, went into effect, phased in 2001, 2002, and you see a lot more multinationals, a lot more venture capitalists coming in. And so by 19, uh, 2007, this is what the industry looks like. All but a dozen of those formerly independent brands have been acquired. I'll play it just one, one more time and ask you to look uh, closely at the blue circles when they come in and see the catalyzing role they play in this process by bundling up a number of brands and then selling them off to big multinational food processors. And so we end up with going from this to this in a very short period of time. And here's a more recent view. Just last month, I updated this chart. And we have the large yellow circles. Those are um, the top 100 food processors in North America. And then the brown circles are our are the organic brands that they have acquired. So you can see a lot of activity, and most of this is hidden from us. Very few of these firms disclose these ownership ties. So for example, General Mills, which in 1999 acquired Cascadian Farm and Muir Glen, then acquired Larabar, Food Should Taste Good, Immaculate Baking. By the time they made this acquisition, they didn't even put out a press release. Those earlier ones, they put out a press release. Now you have to you know, pour through the annual report to find out some of these acquisitions. Annie's homegrown. Any natural food store is gonna carry all of these brands, but if you look at the packaging, you're not going to see this big G, this General Mills symbol. Similar story with Kellogg here. Back in 2007, they acquired Bare Naked Granola for $122 million. Now, up until about a year ago, 
you could go to the Bare Naked website and you would find this timeline. It starts in 2002 with this heartwarming story of childhood friends who reunite, start a business in their kitchen with their $3,000 in savings, max out their credit cards to grow the business, and if you go on the timeline of 2007, there's some information about some of the donations they made, a marketing campaign they have. There's nothing about they're now fully, fully owned by Kellogg, and each of them received $30 million in the process. Uh, it's also, it was also similar for Kashi, acquired long ago in 2000. And up until a few years ago, if you went to the website, for Kashi, it said, we are a small, after 25 years, still fewer than 70 of us, band of passionate people, so on. So they're giving you this illusion that they're a small company. They, they only dropped that a few years ago after they moved the headquarters for this division of Kellogg to Battle Creek, Michigan, where the corporate headquarters is. But there is a counter trend. There are a number of uh, pioneering organic brands who resisted a ton of buyout offers. Uh, Bob's Red Mill hired somebody specifically to fend off, fend off all the buyout requests they were getting. And uh, when Bob retired, he had taken steps to ensure that this became an employee stock ownership uh, company. Uh, and it's really remarkable that these firms have resisted these buyout offers because they're now competing against some of the biggest food companies in the world. And uh, Gary Erickson of Cliff Bar tells that story. He has a book called Raising the Bar about how he was, was about ready to give up, was, was very close to uh, signing with uh, Quaker Oats, a division of Pepsi, for $120 million, and at the last minute decided to, to walk away. He saw that a lot of the values he was trying to, um, you know, the way he was trying to change the food system were not, would not occur with Pepsi. So, uh, his partner wanted the $60 million, so he had to borrow $63 million with interest to, to buy out her share, um, and remarkably has managed to stay in business and, and try and increase their commitment to organic ingredients and so on. So I'm, I've been very impressed by these firms for a number of years. It's hard for us to know that they're independent, that they're not big multinationals. And, uh, but I've, I've unfortunately, just in the last year or so, had to drop two names off the list. So. Applegate Farms has been acquired by Hormel, and then So Delicious Turtle Mountain has been acquired by White Wave. Now the next product I want to talk about is beer. And 50 years ago, beer might have all tasted the same in the United States, but there was a lot more ownership diversity. So back in 1959, Pabst was the 10th largest brewer in the country and they decided to acquire Blatz, B-L-A-T-Z, which was the 18th largest brewer. Uh, this resulted in a combined national market share of 4.5%. So the U.S. government, under antitrust laws, opposed that, that transaction. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, and for the reasons you see there, control of the beer industry into fewer and fewer hands, the Supreme Court overturned that acquisition. So remember, 4.5%. Here's uh, the market share, a proportional but to size, in 2010. One firm, Anheuser-Busch, controls nearly half the market, and another, Miller Coors, controls nearly 30%. So two firms, almost 80% of the market. So obviously the way the government uh, has responded to these, these trends has changed pretty dramatically. But there is a, a positive counter trend. Over here we have Specialty brewers, which in 2010 made up less than 5% of sales. Uh, and they included companies like uh, Boston, Samuel Adams with about 1% market share, Yangling out of Pennsylvania, Sierra Nevada, New Belgium, and a lot of smaller companies. And uh, just five years later, the market share is now 11%. So this is one of the really amazing success stories of uh, a trend away from uniform, uniformity and towards real diversity, but the big brewers have noticed this. And so this graphic shows some of the top dozen firms and their brands and varieties. And I'll zoom in on Anheuser-Busch, which has introduced fake craft brews, 
like Shock Top, Land Shark Lager, Wild Blue. They've also acquired one third of the Craft Brewers Alliance. Uh, they've picked up some actual craft brewers like Goose Island, Blue Point, and then the other big firm, Miller Coors, has done similar things. They have fake craft brews like Blue Moon, and more recently, Third Shift, and they picked up brewers like Wine & Kugels, Henry Weinhards, and just in the last year, they've been even more active. Here are some formerly craft brews. It can no longer be called craft brews, uh, but you won't, you know, by the, uh, the associations, but you will have no way of knowing on the store shelves that these are uh, part of those much bigger companies. And foreign ownership is also hidden. So the, the top four companies that control half of global beer sales are all headquartered in Northern Europe. And back in 2002, uh, Miller was acquired by South Africa Brewers based in London. And then Molson and Coors merged, formed a joint venture with SAB Miller to control 30% of the market. And then in 2008, Anheuser-Busch, which remember controlled almost half the market, uh, was acquired by InBev, which is based in Belgium, but it's actually run by Brazilians. So it's, it's pretty remarkable to think a company of that size, but had not expanded very much globally, was vulnerable to being taken over. Uh, their shareholders were not happy, and that they ended up being acquired by uh, a foreign firm. So all these companies are based in Europe, and uh, the two, Companies on the timeline at the bottom, Heineken and Carlsberg, they're not as dominant in, in North America. Uh, they have more sales in Europe and Asia. So for the last few years, I've been predicting that Heineken or Carlsberg is going to become part of one of these two bigger companies. But uh, they fended off some buyout offers, and you've probably heard that instead, Anheuser-Busch InBev is acquiring SAB Miller. So what that means in the U.S. is probably they're going to just give everything to Molson Coors and, and end that joint venture. But for the rest of the world, about a third of the beer sales are going to be controlled by one company. And you wouldn't know this from the product. Uh, Budweiser still has the red, white, and blue label. It still says in the fine print, Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis, Missouri. It doesn't say InBev. Uh, you still see their ads with patriotic themes and they even sponsor the Made in America Music Festival. So th that might be a little surprising. It's, it's probably less surprising to most of us that colas um, are dominated by just a few firms. I mean, we know that Coke and Pepsi uh, can, have controlled most of the world's sales for decades, but for other soft drinks, there appear to be a lot of choices. So I worked with some of my colleagues in geography at Michigan State uh, Kirk Goldsberry and Chris Duvall, and we wanted to find out just how much ownership diversity is there. So what we did was, this is the Lansing metropolitan area, about 200,000 people, and we went to 94 different retailers. All these retailers sold fresh produce, so we were, do we were doing a fresh produce inventory, and while we were there, we also wrote down every variety of refrigerated soft drink that we could find. So we excluded juices and anything with dairy. We just wanted to focus on uh, sweetened and artificially sweetened beverages that had uh, no nutritive value whatsoever as a contrast to the fresh produce. So how many, in this, this area, how many varieties, different varieties like Coke, Diet Coke, Diet Cherry Coke, how many do you think we found in the Lansing area? Any guesses? 25? No, way higher. There's more than 25 there, right? So in all the 94 retailers. So I keep going. <laughs> 400? Double it. Actually, more than double it. We ended up with 993 unique varieties. And then we looked up the ownership. We found that more than 400 of those were owned by the big three, Coke, Pepsi, and the Dr. Pepper Snapple Group. So these circles are proportional to sales. You can see the market share uh, in parentheses underneath. Uh, but just what varieties and, and brands do they control? For Coke, 
It was 25 different brands, 133 varieties. And some of these are, uh, um, you know, you can figure out, if you pick up a bottle of Sprite, it says in the fine print that it's Coca-Cola product. But some of their more recent acquisitions, things like Honesty, Vitamin Water, NOS Energy Drink, th there's no way to tie them to Coke from the product label. And Pepsi, it was similar. 17 brands, 161 varieties. Uh, some of their acquisitions like Gatorade and Sobe don't make these ownership ties apparent. And by the way, this um, large cluster up here, that's Gatorade. We found 42 different kinds of Gatorade just in Lansing. And you know, looking at the websites, there's a lot more available nationally. Then there's the Dr. Pepper Snapple Group, which has 21 brands, 113 varieties. And here are some of the brands they own. So you're looking at a shelf full of fruit flavored soft drinks. You might think you have a lot of choices, uh, but those are all owned by just one firm. So that leaves um, you know, over 400, over 500 varieties that are not owned by those big three. Uh, but the problem is over 300 of those, we only found in one retailer each. So we have a lot of very tiny companies out there um, that maybe get into one convenience store here or there. And then we have you know, the market that's really dominated by those big three. So the two of those together, and all the, all the brands that are owned by those big companies, give us the illusion that there's a lot of choices out there. And then we looked at uh, wine. And we used the same kind of approach. And we were really interested in wine because no other product category offers as many choices. Even a small supermarket that emphasizes wine might have a thousand different varieties. So we kind of got in over our head, um, went to 20 different retailers, mostly Lansing, uh, but a couple an hour away in Ann Arbor because we wanted to see a Whole Foods and a Trader Joe's. And we wrote down thousands and thousands of varieties of wine and then you know, culled through all the duplicates and then tried to figure out ownership of all those varieties. So we ended up with more than 3,600 unique varieties, 1,800 brands, and then we took those brands and figured out the ownership. Uh, some cases it was relatively easy, some cases very, very difficult. And then we mapped it, and here's the result. Um, 1,000 different firms for those 1,800 brands. So, there is a lot of ownership diversity out there, uh, but it really depends on where you shop because half of the sales in the US are controlled by just three firms. And uh, in Michigan, where it's allowed to sell wine and uh, chain uh, drugstores like Rite Aid and CVS, over half of the 100 or so varieties we would find were owned by just two companies. Uh, if you go to a more, an independent wine specialist, you find a lot more ownership diversity, particularly at the higher price points. So these top five companies control more than 200 brands. And uh, unless you're buying the, the bottle of Gallo on the bottom shelf, the jug, um, those ownership ties are not gonna be at all obvious. Uh, they're very difficult to figure out. Um, so three firms, half the market, uh, but wine, because it's so diverse, um, and because of the culture and um, the amount of people are willing to spend on wine, the trend towards uniformity and ownership is occurring more slowly than most of the under, other industries I've looked at. And you know, there is a counter trend of more and more wineries. You've probably seen it here. I know in Michigan, uh, just a few years ago, we had about 100 wineries, and now we're up to about 200. And here's just an example of one that was actually fairly easy to figure out the ownership because we just went to some websites, but it shows you how convoluted it can be to figure it out. Uh, you've probably seen these boxes of wine like a Silver Birch from New Zealand, a Mono from Italy. At the bottom of those boxes, it says Octavan Home Wine Bar. So we went to the Octavan Home Wine Bar website and it said, registered trademark of Underdog Wine and Spirits. So we went to the Underdog Wine and Spirits website and not on the main page, but on the about page, we scrolled through several paragraphs and where it said in the fine print, a unit of the wine group. 
the second largest wine company in the US. So it's, it's kind of ironic that they describe themselves as underdogs. So I want to just pause for a second here and see if there are one or two questions or comments before I talk about the other three areas. Does anybody have anything? Yeah. Is it inherently bad for the producers on the ground? Um, I would say there's a lot of potential for, for problems because uh, when you're dealing with buyers that are smaller, they, it's an, more of a negotiation between equals. When you're dealing with a big multinational company, uh, they have a lot more power in those negotiations. And that's assuming they maintain their commitment to organic. It's, it's pretty common on these acquisitions, brands that have, were historically 100% organic uh, that, that commitment has been dropped and they've gone to you know, just a few percent or even not organic at all because it's more profitable for the company. Because consumers, they may associate that brand with organic food and they don't constantly check the labels. Yeah, I'm going to talk more about that tomorrow, but um, Haines Celestial is the one firm on there, along with White Wave, White Wave is a unique case, that discloses its ownership ties. Because it has its origins from 1930 as a natural foods company, it's not afraid to, to say that it is a, a natural foods brand. Uh, organic consumers tend to be more leery of supporting something that has Kellogg or General Mills on the package. So White Wave is a case where you know, Steve Demos created this company, White Wave, to sell soy milk. It was acquired by a giant dairy processor, Dean. Dean, you know, saw its stock price slide, so they spun off all their natural organic brands. So there, it's, it's a, now a natural organic company, uh, but it's, it's really huge. But for consumers, it doesn't have that baggage of some of those other firms. Yeah, one last question. Yeah, I will talk about that. So. so the next area I want to talk about is production, which can be even more concentrated than ownership in some cases. So for example, in the US, dairy processing, we've gone from processing about 9 million pounds in 1960 to nearly 200 million pounds by 2010. But over that same period, we've gone from more than 5,000 different processing plants to just over 300. So one of the consequences of this trend is these processing plants produce many different brands of milk under different labels. So uh, you know, consumer magazines will tell you a lot of the, the supermarkets you go to, you'll see a very expensive brand name milk and a less expensive store brand milk. Uh, you might as well buy that store brand milk because they're absolutely identical. They're coming out of the same plant. It's a similar story with eggs. Uh, here's an example I'm familiar with because uh, Herb Brooks is located about an hour from where I live, and so I knew where on Google Earth to find images of two of their four operations. I don't know where the other two are, but they have 85 hen houses. Each of these are over a football field long, and I don't remember how many uh, chickens they have, but they say they produce 60% of Michigan's eggs, all of McDonald's eggs, each of the Mississippi, and they have three different brands plus a pretty big number of supermarket private labels uh, that are all coming out of this one plant. So why is this a problem? Well, we found out back in 2010 when there was an epidemic of salmonella that was traced back to eggs. And these eggs were coming from just two farms uh, in the same county in Iowa. And it turns out only because of this recall that we learned that these were being uh, packaged under a number of different brands. They were also being sent to half a, 
half a dozen different processing facilities where they were repackaged under even more brands. So they ended up going to 22 different states and were sold under more than 40 different brands. And I mentioned uh, bag salads and leafy greens at the beginning. Um, this was the case in 2006 when there was an epidemic of E. coli that was traced back to one processing plant. It was a dull product that was implicated, but we learned that more than 40 different products were being packaged at this one facility, including natural selections, direct competitors like Dole and Ready Pack. So this is what the industry calls uh, contract packing or co-packing, and it's really common uh, to outsource a lot of production this way. And some companies are even uh, pretty upfront about admitting this. So Newman's Own, uh, which was started for charity, uh, you know, they say they, they uh, outsource everything. They just have a very small office in California. And then Natural Value is another one. This was started by a guy named Gary Cohen, and he worked in the distribution industry. And one day he noticed that the four different brands of mustard he was distributing all had the exact same typo on their packaging. And that's when he learned about co-packing, and he decided he could do that. So he has a business out of his house where he designs the label, outsources all the actual production, and he sells these products for less than the pr presumably identical products that they're next to on the shelf because those branded products are spending more on marketing and advertising. So these are kind of like Nike doesn't make shoes. These are uh, companies that don't make anything. They focus on branding and advertising. And I'm going to go back to the beer industry to mention uh, Pabst. Uh, over the years, it's picked up a number of other different brands like Stroh, Schlitz, Old Milwaukee. But this is a virtual beer company. Everything is actually brewed under contract by S.A.B. Miller. But in 2010, this guy Metropolos paid $250 million just for the rights to those brands, you know, to have commercials and to market these beers, not to actually produce them. And last year, he sold this company for $750 million. So he's not actually making anything, uh, nearly tripled his investment in five years. So the positive counter trend you know all about, uh, Vermont is a national leader in this area of local sourcing, uh, making it more obvious for consumers um, at retailers, restaurants, and even institutions that the food uh, is local. And uh, another example of this is farmer's markets, of course. Farmer's markets have increased pretty dramatically in popularity. When I moved to the Lansing area about 10 years ago, there were just a few farmer's markets. And uh, so my wife helped bring a, a new farmer's market to East Lansing. And now we have 20 farmer's markets in the metro area. So the third area I want to talk about is ingredients and the trend towards uniformity there. So it's estimated that the average American's diet, two-thirds of our calories come from these four products, soy, corn, wheat, and dairy. And over half of the cropland in the U.S. is planted in uh, soy and corn. And you know, these products are heavily subsidized by the federal government, so they end up be being very cheap for uh, food processors, and they take these, um, these commodities and they further transform them into things like milk protein concentrate, high fructose corn syrup, hydrogenated oils, and if you've seen the movie King Corn, you know that it would be very hard for you to make some of these substances in your own kitchen, and you also know that they are not very healthy for us. There are a lot of negative health impacts of eating these substances, but because they're so cheap, uh, they become the foundation of foods that people describe as ultra-processed, engineered, synthetic, fake. And you know, these are designed by engineers with artificial flavors and textures to be what, what the industry calls craveable. You, know, you and I would probably call them addictive. And uh, people end up eating more and more of these products and the, they are sold at very high profit margins, typically 70 to 90 percent more than cost, which compares to 30 percent is more typical in the food industry. So these big profit margins um, encourage companies to even spend more money marketing and advertising these products, encouraging people to eat more. And some of them even present the illusion that they contain real food. 
So here's Kellogg's Apple Jacks. Uh, you have to go way down on the ingredient list to see that there is actually less apples than salt in this cereal. Uh, another Kellogg's product is even worse. Mini Wheats Blueberry, you see a cartoon figure juggling some real blueberries, but if you look at that ingredient list, blueberries are not anywhere on there. And even firms, even uh, foods that you wouldn't think of as ultra-processed are becoming subject to these trends. Um, tuna, these three firms control 80% of the canned tuna market. And if you look at the front of the package, uh, you would assume that it contains tuna, water, you wouldn't be surprised if it maybe contains some salt, right? But if you actually look at the ingredient list, they all contain ultra-processed, hydrolyzed soy, soy protein. Now, they disguise this on the label as vegetable broth. Uh, one company, if you go to the website, almost admits it. Uh, the broth is from one or more of the following vegetables. The first one listed is soybeans. And they all have to disclose contained soybeans. The reason they use this ultra-processed product is it's cheaper than the tuna, and it allows them to extend it. But the, the hydrolyzed protein and the, this chemical pyrophosphate, they both help the tuna absorb more water. So a few years ago, um, these companies paid out millions of dollars to California counties to settle a lawsuit that the amount of tuna that was listed on the label was actually less than, than was listed. So what ends up happening with these trends is that uh, even though we've used 7,000 different crops throughout history uh, as food, today just 12 crops and five animal species uh, provide 70% of the world's food, food supply. And this makes us ver very vulnerable to disasters and uh, also affects our nutrition to rely on so, so few foods. So the counter trend I'm going to start with, this is from The Onion, this is satire, <laughs> Omnigrain Cheerios made with every grain on earth. Um, that's just to set up the next slide, this is not satire, this is real, you've probably seen this in the stores, Cheerios plus ancient grains, uh, they have Coruscant wheat, quinoa, spelt, um, now I don't think that Cheerios, that General Mills is doing this because they're concerned about increasing uniformity of, of ingredients. I think it's because um, much smaller companies have started offering uh, you know, other options, more diverse types of foods, and they're really exploding in popularity. So they're getting on the bandwagon here and offering people more options when it comes to these foods. And the last area I want to talk about is breeds and seeds. Now, at the beginning, I mentioned Holsteins provide 93% of the milk in the US. It's actually much worse than that because even though there are 3.7 million cows in the US, they have the genetic diversity that you would expect to find in just 60 animals. So most of them are, uh, are uh, descended from just four families. And this is a problem because uh, geneticists say that 100 is really the minimum size, effective population size, that you need to maintain genetic diversity. So Scandinavian countries are actually concerned about this, and they're starting to work to increase effective population size, even if it comes to the expense of maximum milk production. Uh, but in the US, there isn't as much concern about that. In pork, there are about 500 breeds of pork worldwide. But in the US, just three, the Hampshire, Yorkshire, and the Duroc provide about 75% of the genetics of commercial pork. Uh, the least uh, diverse uh, animal, though, is probably turkeys. Well over 99% of the world's turkeys are just one breed, the broad-breasted white. And back in 1997, the American Livestock Breed Conservancy conducted a census to find out how many turkeys in the U.S. were not broad-breasted white. They could only find 1,300 birds in the entire U.S that were not this breed. So they probably could have all fit into this grow outhouse. And then it got worse because in 2004, uh, a European company acquired the last remaining uh, turkey breeder in North America and eliminated all that breeding stock. So we now have just two firms based in Europe, EW Group and Hendrix Genetics, that control 
nearly 100% of the breeding supply, relying on just a few strains of this one breed. And these same two firms also control over 95% of egg-laying chickens in the world. And we found out last year why this might be a problem. I mean, we knew before then, but you might remember that avian influenza was circulating last year. Uh, more than seven million turkeys were killed, more than 42 million chickens. And there was a lot of concern that prices were gonna go way up for Thanksgiving or that we might even not be able to have turkeys for Thanksgiving. So they were able to contain that at a cost to US taxpayers of nearly a billion dollars. But this year there's a new strain circulating and they're dealing with this again. So the positive counter trend probably most of you here know about heritage breed turkeys are becoming more popular. Even back in 2006, it was estimated that there were uh, now 10,000 heritage breed turkeys, so the numbers are probably higher. And a lot of people are willing to pay more for these, these turkeys, so we're continuing to see more people getting into this industry. This is an image from National Geographic uh, showing the fruit and vegetable seeds that were available in 1903 at the top in uh, commercial seed houses. 80 years later, 1983 is at the bottom. These were the ones that were available at the National Seed Storage Laboratory. It's not a, a direct comparison, uh, but it's clear there's been a trend towards increasing uniformity in fruit and vegetable seeds. And of course, the emphasis has been on increasing production and increasing durability, not on taste or nutrition or any other things that, that we might value. And it's the same with commodities like corn. 47% uh, of hybrid corn genetics are derived from just uh, one, from Reed's yellow dent corn. And you know when the corn supply was very uniform in the 1970s, we saw what a problem that was when there was a corn blight and there were huge economic losses because so much of the corn crop was lost to that blight. So to your question about uh, seed companies, uh, that's not the only reason, but the consolidation of the seed industry has played a big role in these trends. So those large red circles that you see, those are chemical companies that started to take over the seed industry in the 1980s, and they've been very successful. The top three seed companies in the world uh, are chemical companies, and they're tying their, their proprietary chemicals to these seeds. Uh, this is Robert Fraley from Monsanto. Uh, he won the World Food Prize, which sounds really impressive until you find out that uh, Monsanto was a major funder of that prize. But back at the beginning of that period, 1996, he said, what you're, not, what you're seeing is not just a consolidation of seed companies, it's really a consolidation of the entire food chain. So he was talking about the critical position of seeds as the first step in food production and the control that gives the companies to downstream firms like grain processors like Cargill, which Monsanto formed joint ventures with. In fact, Cargill sold all their seed divisions to, to Monsanto. And Monsanto made more than 50 acquisitions and uh, dozens of uh, joint ventures during this period, including uh, picking up Seminus, a fruit and vegetable seed company. It was actually right before Monsanto acquired this company, the Mexican billionaire who had borrowed all this money to acquire a number of these companies uh, one of the ways he tried to make that money to, to pay back those loans was to eliminate 2,000 varieties of fruit and vegetable seeds from the catalog, the ones that were least profitable. He wanted to really focus on the most profitable varieties and dominate the market in those. So there have been some big changes in this industry just in the last few months. ChemChina announced they're planning to take over Syngenta, so a Chinese chemical company is gonna take over this Swiss chemical seed company. And then the number two seed company in the world, DuPont, is going to merge with Dow. So um, we're gonna have about just three firms controlling nearly 60% of the proprietary seeds in the world. So the positive counter trend here is of course um, uh, heirloom seeds. Uh, there's a lot of evidence of you know, the seed companies that are focusing on heirloom seeds are growing very rapidly. One of them sponsors uh, an heirloom expo in California every year, which attracts, uh, last I heard, more than 20,000 people. Um, so there's a lot of interest in this. And so just to recap, you know, I've talked about the trends away from diversity and towards uniformity in ownership, production, 
ingredients and breeds and seeds. Um, and I mentioned some, some counter trends like heritage turkeys and microbrews uh, that are trying to oppose those trends. But I want to end by just saying three things that for those of, us, those of us who are concerned about this, what can we do about it? I would suggest these three, and I'm hoping that you'll have more in the Q&A. Uh, the first is avoid the supermarket. You know, if you're growing your own food, you can grow heritage breeds, heirloom seeds, um, even if it's just growing some sprouts in your kitchen. Um, for the foods that you can't grow, you know, you can go to your local farms or farmers markets and really seek out those rare and unusual varieties. Uh, the added benefit is that they often taste much better than anything you can find in the supermarket. So number two, uh, most of us can't get all of our food uh, from ourselves or from, from local farms. So when we do go to the grocery store or the supermarket, we can be a diversity detective and try and find out what's really behind what we're buying. And I want to mention a couple tools that have made this easier. One is goodguide.com. You can go to this website or download their app, uh, type in a product or take a picture of the barcode, and it will give you a score for that product compared to others in that same category for health, environment, society, as well as an overall score. And if you scroll down, uh, you can find some ownership information. Uh, the problem is Good Guide is not always up to date on ownership information. Uh, so there's another tool, bicot.com, also an app and a website. And you can see in this example of Bold House Farms, they're actually owned by Campbell's Soup Company. And then the third thing I want to suggest is become involved with organizations that are working against your uniformity and towards real diversity. Uh, these are just a few, uh, and I guess I want to highlight Slow Food, which often has a local chapter and can help you find some of those rare and un unusual foods in your area. So will these three things be enough to reverse these trends towards uniformity and move us towards diversity? Probably not, um, not unless we also tell our friends, our neighbors, our relatives that we need to look uh, be beyond the brands and look for real diversity. Thanks. <laughs> Questions or comments? Yeah, Marty. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, when Obama was first elected, he appointed a number of reform-minded people in the USDA, Department of Justice. Within a few years, they'd all quit or um, had been forced out. And it's because uh, the, the heads of these agencies and the federal judges don't see those laws the way that legislators saw them in the early 20th century. Attorney General right now. Yeah. They, they could stop that if they want to. Yeah, some of these mergers. Yeah. I mean, some of these mergers are so big and the problems for consumers are so evident. I mean, that's what happens is the University of Chicago economists and law lawyers have indoctrinated federal judges that this is not a problem if it affects farmers. They don't care about that. It's only a problem if it affects consumers. And even then, it takes a lot of evidence to show that. But in the case of beer, Anheuser-Busch wanted to acquire the other half of Grupo Modelo that they didn't own, brands like Corona. And because they had so blatantly raised prices after they'd been acquired by InBev, and SAB, SAB Miller had matched those, they actually blocked that, that acquisition and were forced to sell to Constellation. So I was kind of surprised by that, but it was, it was something that was kind of in our face. 
you know, nobody really knows what's going on in the seed industry or the chemical, uh, you know, agricultural chemical industry, so I would be more surprised if the, the U.S. government did anything there. Kind of a shoot off of, the, off of that question is a lot of these companies that you mentioned were also international. So how do those regulations, do they just slide past an overall like national regulations? Or is there any countries that are proving their regulatory systems are higher than these companies and actually doing something to prevent the sale or the mergers? Yeah, there's no uh, global body that looks at antitrust issues. Um, so in some cases, the EU has been a little more aggressive. Uh, I don't have examples from the food industry, but with Microsoft, uh, they were more aggressive than the US government. But the problem is we have all these global trade agreements that are moving us in the opposite direction, that are giving these companies more and more power to prevent governments from regulating them. So uh, I, my uh, question, of course, is about the organic industry, and the issue of concentration there has been raised by a number of organizations as proof that the standards have been watered down in order to allow all of these companies to take over uh, organic. And um, I would counter that 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 the problem is really one of the way our economic system is structured that makes it um, inevitable if you're going to participate in this market economy that eventually, you know, those, those few holdouts that you pointed to there, they, they have struggled and they are continuing to struggle and they will probably struggle forever to maintain that independence. And even then, you know, they're, they're all pretty good-sized companies. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I just was interested in what your take on that is. Yeah, I'm going to talk more about organic standards tomorrow, but I would say that uh, certainly it's an oversimplification, but for production of organic food, the standards have not really been watered down. In fact, they've been tightened up in areas like uh, uh, sourcing organic seeds, for example when it comes to processing in the downstream stages, I, I think you could make a case that, that the standards have been watered down and it, it's allowed bigger companies to be more dominant. Yeah, back there. So, so I'm gonna take a counter to what Marty just asked about antitrust. So I, I'm, I came a little bit late, so you might've covered this, so if you did, then I apologize. But maybe Sort of address this. So the question is this: I think you, you can make it, and you made a very good argument as to why we're losing the sort of diversity that we all value. So that's very clear. But it, and that we're working toward uniformity of some sort, which we I think we all could agree that it's not a good thing. But then that leaves the question of what level of diversity truly will protect the public interest, as opposed to saying that you have as opposed to three companies to make very bad food for us, you have seven or eight. But, the, but they're still, still selling more, you know, greater amounts of sugary things. So I don't think the fact that there's less, fewer companies that sell bad food is necessarily good or bad thing. It's just it's a reflection of consolidation. So if you look back in many other industries, as an example, Google, controls 70% of the search market. Microsoft, even today, controls the majority of the software sort of industry. So we went through this 20 years ago when Microsoft, when the government pretty much was about ready to break it up. They chose not to do that. So the question that I have is, looking at other industries beyond food in terms of concentration, protecting public interest, I would argue that it's, that except for the seed part, which I think that I agree that are very problematic, for many reasons. That if you look at the retail side of things in terms of concentration, I'm not sure whether you could really make the argument that greater diversity leads to greater public interest if the assumption is that 
diversity still leads to more companies selling the same bad stuff to us. So I'm not quite sure I understand the argument that greater diversity of companies that sell bad stuff was necessarily better than fewer companies that sell bad stuff to us. Well, let me make my bias clear up front is that even if there were no negative impacts, I would have a problem with so few firms controlling a food industry because it's, it's elitist. And you know, I, I believe in uh, democracy, and, and so that's why I would oppose that. But to get to your, your more specific point, institutional, institutional economists have a pretty rough rule of thumb that when four firms control 40% or more of a market, it's no longer competitive. So when it's not competitive, then companies do things like raise prices uh, more than they could in a competitive environment. Uh, they you know, drop the prices to their workers and, and suppliers, and innovation rates go down. And I think you could make the case in the tech industry, once these firms get a big, really dominant market share, they're not innovating. You know, there are organizational reasons for that too. When a company gets to that size, it's very hard to get past 17 committees to get an innovation through. Um, the only innovation that's coming out of companies like Microsoft, Yahoo, and Google are things that they're buying from smaller companies for the most part. So I think just from a strict economist, which is a very narrow way to look at it, you could say that in none of these industries should four firms have four, more than 40% market share. But I would say uh, it should probably be a lot less than that. Curious, Phil, you take uh, the, the piece that wasn't there sort of in the four categories was distribution. And when you look at uh, U.S. Foods, Cisco, the United Foods International, um, you know, with the decrease in diversity de there, does that, or, or is there, or does that actually make an impact in your view? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, with the exception of restaurant supply, uh, distribution is a little more, um, there's more competition. Uh, but yeah, Cisco tried to acquire U.S. Foods, and because of people like uh, people organizing uh, groups like Food and Water Watch, making the case that the market share, you know, the national market would be dominated by just one firm, it would be a monopoly, and the government, surprising to me, actually blocked that acquisition. So uh, we still have two national distributors, and uh, you know, for more specialty products, uh, there are. Uh, you know, a lot more competitors because it's such a tough industry. It's uh, it's really hard to. Um, there are a lot of logistical challenges and, and a lot of capital costs, and so it, it kind of capitalists like to go where it's safe to be dominant and make a lot of money. And distribution isn't quite quite there yet. I mean, they're going to change laws like the beer distributors, uh, the beer producers, and the retailers. They're all the, the retailers and the beer producers are working to change our. Uh, post-prohibition laws that require a three-tier system because they see a way to, to get rid of these government-prescribed middlemen and make more money. So Costco did away with the state um, you know, liquor, liquor uh, retailers in Washington state. Uh, Anheuser-Busch InBev now owns many distributors in states where that's allowed, um, and so they're increasing their, their power in that area too. Hold on, Simon. Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Um, my first question is, if you could give a brief history of how the chemical companies came to own so much of the seed industry um, and, and how that might be tied to um, fossil fuels as most chemicals are petroleum-based. Um, and then the second question is the three, the three pieces of advice that you gave to us in this room to change this system um, are three things that most of us have the luxury and the privilege of being able to do, but a, a vast number of people um, don't have those luxuries to avoid supermarkets. Um, they don't have, uh, you know, food deserts are very real in America. And so I'm wondering what we can do on an individual level and what we can do as a society um, to, try and, to try and make a change on a grander level um, 
that's, that's more available to people of all socioeconomic backgrounds. Okay, are you going to be able to make my talk tomorrow night? Where is it here? Uh, Most likely. Okay, because I'll, I'll be talking about the seed industry there and how the chemical industry took over. The short answer is the chemical industry became a lot less profitable and intellectual property laws were changing and they saw an opportunity to move into seeds. Um, the second question, um, I would say about you know half the world's population is able to do a lot of these things like grow their own food or, or source buy from uh, local farms. Uh, but there are a lot of people in this country and other uh, very industrialized countries um, who, yeah, who can't afford to, to buy a heritage turkey for Thanksgiving, for example. So I'm hoping you have, and I know a lot of you are working on these issues of how to get better food, culturally appropriate, nutritious, sustainable food to people who can't, uh, you know, we live in this, you know, Grace was making the point, the system we're in uh, doesn't allow people who don't have money to support their values like, like some of us do. So it's a really tough question and, and I don't have all the answers for that. the companies being less and less diversified themselves and then how they how that sort of trickles into the retail. Do you, on, on the other, I guess, half of that, um, in your research and review and things like that, did you find any retailers in particular that are working sort of from the top end in to make things a little bit better, a little more diversified or is the idea of just you know Whole Foods and Trader Joe's and some of these other markets just is that just as illusory as anything else? Everybody just shoves all the same things on the shelf and says, "Hooray, we have organic products." Um, I'm curious if you have any. Just sort of is there more of a top-down versus a bottom-up? Yeah, there's an example from Canada. Um, I'm blanking the name, but a, a very dominant chain in Canada. That's it's been on the leading edge of. Um, sustainability compared to US firms. There are also smaller regional chains, like there's one in Kansas City uh, that really wanted to source local food uh, and wanted to help get past the, the infrastructural barriers that's, that uh, local farmers were having. So they, for example, uh, allocated some of their, wear, their refrigerator space to these local farms and um, were able to, you know, provide uh, small loans to help get them going and so on. So see more and more examples like that, um, you, know, um, you know, some of these food hubs around the country, a lot of them have uh, uh, nonprofit involvement and some grants, but there are some, you know, fully private uh, distributors that are working to, uh, you know, these values-based value chains that we were talking about earlier today, that it's not just about, you know, cheap food. I mean, there are always going to be some people who just, just want cheap food, but there are more and more people according to surveys and, and sales figures that want to support other values of sustainability and local purchasing and uh, more nutritious and healthier foods and so on. So uh, yeah, there are lots of examples out there. Yeah. Bill, on your oh. um, slide on the avian flu, um, you show Wright County Farms and Hillsdale Farms. Those are both Jack DeCoster Farms, aren't they? Yeah. So it's really just one one ownership. Yeah, it was it was some very convoluted ownership, and uh, Tom Philpot and Mother Jones did did some really uh, good investigative reporting to help figure that out. And uh, then he was, they, they they shared the same. What's that? I mean, they were shell companies and all this, but they were both sourcing the same feed. Uh, they were both getting feed from the same place, so if that feed was contaminated, which they suspect, and that's, that was the issue. But yeah, Jack DeCoster had ownership of egg farms all over the country that, it, you know, it really took some, some legal digging to figure out he was the actual owner. So yeah, it's a fascinating story. Um, to sort of back up to the, to the previous question, 
When you talk about um, it, it, sort of retailers trying to implement those kind of values, you're also talking about retailers who have to exist in sort of a competitive market. Our local uh, food co-op, in order to survive Whole Foods showing up a half mile down the road, now has more varieties of Newman O's than I can count on the shelves and um, a lot of things that are owned by these big groups, which they didn't previously have. They were previously, you know, bulk foods and game and local produce. And in order to survive in, in this sort of environment where Whole Foods is gonna pop up on every corner, what, what would you say to groups that are trying to survive that sort of situation? How can they do it without compromising that sort of value system? Yeah, that's a really tough question because I've, I've been on the board of my local food co-op and we've got a Whole Foods opening this year across the street, first one in the area. And you know, I, I thought even before Whole Foods came in that there was too much, the entire center of the store is stuff that comes off the UNFI truck that's Numino's and General Mills and Kellogg's products. And you know, I, I was, I, you're not gonna outcompete Whole Foods in that area because they have an agreement with UNFI to give them big price breaks, even though this is against the robinson Patman Act antitrust law that was passed to stop A&P back in the 1930s. Uh, Whole Foods and Walmart get away with that um, because of the way those laws are interpreted now. So you're not gonna win by trying to sell stuff off the UNFI truck that's cheaper. So it's disappointing to hear that the, the, the co-op has gone down that route. Um, so I don't, I'm not working in the industry, so I'm not sure they should listen to my advice, but I would say do a better job of those original values of supplying things people couldn't get at the mainstream retailers. Yeah. I just have a comment more than a question, but it occurs to me that everything you're doing um, in revealing the ownership in particular it's, it's really important in the sense that most people shopping in stores, just it's, they're just kind of faked out, like you said, the fake organics. And all this material, because I've seen some of your, your, your animations and graphics, the more that could get out into the public eye, the better. You know, I don't know if, I know you've got your website, but are there any other ways that your wonderful graphics and infographics are getting out there in a broader audience, like within a documentary or, I mean, your book, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering too, like I'd love for any of the stuff to go viral on, online because I feel like most consumers would like to know this and understand all these hits. Even the beer stuff is really mind blowing, I think, for like the fake craft brew brands and things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I wish I had more time to do that. This is just a brief response to the person who's talking about um, the Walmart coming in and the co-op going down. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, Whole Foods, sorry. Uh, I'm not well informed about how these things work necessarily, um, but something I know from growing up in New York City is that there's a lot of power behind neighborhood councils and uh, just like people who get together and say, we don't want this. Um, so for example, in Brooklyn, a neighborhood council got together with the representatives and the state or the city senate or whatever the group is and changed the zoning to keep a Trader Joe's out of the neighborhood to avoid gentrification. Um, so these things are possible. The city does it with Walmart. The zoning laws are made so that they can't exist within the boroughs. So in terms of keeping these companies out to protect your local businesses, I think those kinds of individual steps of getting together as people and saying this is something we don't want is really, really important and entirely doable. Yeah, absolutely. I hadn't heard about that Trader Joe's example, so that's really encouraging. I have heard about a pretty large number of examples of Walmarts being blocked across the US, and it's also been very encouraging to see Walmart's been really struggling lately uh, their stock price has gone way down. The, the Walton heirs have lost billions of dollars in, in their personal wealth. I'm, I'm cheering all that on. So we're getting to the point in the evening where we need to be asking our last one or two questions. I know you've had your hand up and maybe one after that. And we have Phil Howard on campus all day tomorrow with another talk in the Gorge at uh, 7 p.m. Um, 
uh, with a talk entitled uh, Concentration and Power in the Food System, so it'll be more focused, and he's alluded to the topics that are there um, in tomorrow's talk also. So without further ado, one question here, and then if there's another one, and then um, Phil, you'll be available after the talk here yeah. Yeah, for some individual questions if you have it also. Thank you, everyone. you talk a little bit about um, the impact of all of this on farm workers? Uh, just a little bit, because it's not something I study myself, um, and it's something that, you know, I'm trained as a rural sociologist that we haven't paid enough attention to. Um, I mean, there are, these are populations that are very hard to study. Um, so, I mean, one really great book that's come out recently was by Seth Holmes. Um, he's an anthropologist and a medical doctor, and he spent time traveling with farm workers uh, to understand all the issues they're dealing with. But yeah, certainly they are the, the most vulnerable uh, members of the food system in many ways. Um, uh, but I always try to you know, leave people with a sense of hope. So you know, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers uh, have done a lot of great work of raising visibility of that, putting pressure on uh, the people who buy uh, tomatoes uh, to increase the prices that they pay. And uh, there was an article in the New York Times about a year ago um, that demonstrated how dramatically uh, conditions have improved as a result of that for the, the farms that are participating and you know, supplying those retailers. So those are some encouraging signs, but there's still you know, a lot of problems to be addressed. Thanks.